Okay, so uh, let me first thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to give this um, series of talks. So I'll tell you about some aspects of non-equilibrium dynamics of quantum systems. Now this is a really vast subject, so what I'm going to do is just tell you a few things which I'm most familiar with. Um, there are many other things, I'll point out some things at the end which I won't have time to cover, but uh, this is just a very small portion of this big subject. Um, so there are two um, places where you can read more about this. One is this review article by Krishnendu Sengupta and others. And the other is this book by Amit Datta and others. Um, but even these really don't cover uh, everything in the subject. In fact, a lot of things have uh, happened in the last couple of years. So the outline of the talk is as follows. Um, so first I'll tell you about uh, quenching dynamics. So what happens when you quench a quantum system across a quantum critical point and uh, you get defects that are produced and the density of defect scales in a particular way with the quenching rate, which is called the kibble zurek scaling. Um, then I'll tell you about uh, the quench, what happens when you quench across a quantum critical line instead of a critical point, and what happens if you quench in a nonlinear way in time. Uh, then I'll tell you about two models, transverse field Ising model in one dimension and the Kitai model in two dimensions. The reason for telling you about these models is that um, uh, they'll play a big role in this talk, as you'll see. I mean, many of the calculations that I'll show you have been done in these two models. And they're kind of fun models. Okay? They're exactly solvable. And we'll actually go through the solution of these models. And we can actually discuss these models more in the tutorial at the end of today. Um, then I'll say something about the effects of topology and uh, also interactions on um, quenching quenching dynamics. So these four things are in the field of quenching dynamics. Then the last two are in the area of uh, what's called Floquet dynamics. So what happens if you periodically drive some system? So you take the Hamiltonian and one of the parameters of the Hamiltonian, you vary it periodically in time. So that's called uh, periodic driving. And there's something called Floquet theory which is used to analyze that. And we'll see that, you know, periodic driving can give rise to edge modes. Which, uh, so even if the system, the time independent part of the system has no edge modes, just by driving it, you can produce edge modes. And I'll say a little bit about topological invariance at that point. And finally, I'll end with some work on um, some ideas about how we can manipulate the uh, energy momentum dispersion in various materials using periodic driving. And I'll give some examples from graphene, uh, how we can manipulate the usual Dirac dispersion. And you can also achieve something called dynamical localization, where you can completely freeze the motion of the electrons by periodic driving. So that's the outline uh, for all the three talks together. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll be able to do all of this. So feel free to stop me at any point if something I say is not clear. And uh, it's more important that you understand everything that I say rather than I go through everything uh, very fast. Okay? So just interrupt me whenever you want. Okay, so the first thing I want to tell you about is um, the formation of defects due to quench. Okay. So this was actually pointed out a very long time ago, um, in the 70s, that if you uh, take a system uh, across a critical temperature, so it could be a classical system and you vary the temperature. Okay. Uh, let's say from high temperature to low temperature so that you go across the critical temperature of the system, then it can produce a variety of defects in the system. And in fact, this may have played a role in the early universe. So cooling of the universe may have led to the formation of a variety of defects. Now these defects themselves can be of various dimensionalities. You can have domain walls, which are two-dimensional, strings which are one-dimensional, or magnetic monopoles. And typically these happen, in the early universe, this would have happened due to the spontaneous symmetry breaking of some scalar field. Okay. Um, so we'll not discuss this, but this is kind of the history. And so this was pointed out by uh, some Russians first. And then uh, there was some work by Kibble who, who showed this more generally. Then it was pointed out that you can actually test all this in the lab. Okay? And you can quench a system, at, uh, you know, helium-4 across the normal superfluid transition. And this can lead to domains. 
and different domains have different phases of the uh, post condensate okay. uh, or you can produce vortices okay, which are sort of lines, line defects ok. So, this was um, discussed by Zurek and then there is a review article by Zurek uh, in 96. Now, the important thing is that the density of defects that you produce depends on the rate of quenching ok. So, by that rate of quenching I mean that so, there is some parameter that you are varying in the system and let us say you are varying this linearly in time ok. So, the rate at which you vary this is the rate of quenching ok. So, the word quenching is sometimes used for a sudden quench, a sudden change of something, but I am going to use this in the sense of uh, not a sudden quench, but something where you vary something linearly in time. And so, it there will be a rate associated with that and we will see that the density of defect depends on the rate of quenching as a power law and, and that power law actually tells you a lot about the um, critical point that the system goes through while it is being quenched. So, in the case of helium 4, Zurek predicted that the density of vortices will scale with the quenching time. So, the inverse of the quenching rate is the quenching time tau and so, he predicted that the density of vortices will scale as 1 by root tau. So, of course, if you quench very very slowly, so tau is very large, then you hardly produce any vortices ok, which is what you expect quench really really infinitely infinitely slowly you should not produce any defects ok. So, here is a hand waving derivation of this Kibble Zurek scaling. Um, so, suppose that we are varying the temperature. So, this part is about quenching of a classical system where you vary the temperature, but the rest of the uh, all the talks will be about quantum systems where you quench across quantum critical points, but the ideas are very similar. So, um, suppose that we vary the temperature of a system uh, T linearly in time to take it across the critical value T c. So, the time dependence at least close to T c is of this form T minus T c is the time divided by this quenching time tau. So, um, so, let us say a defect is formed when the temperature is close to T c. So, when the correlation time uh, xi t is T minus T c times tau. Okay. So, that just follows from this equation because xi t is the time when the um, defect is formed. Uh, and the defect is formed uh, only when you are very close to the critical temperature. If you are far away, then you do not form defects. So, if you are deep in the ordered or deep in the disordered phase, you do not you only produce them when you approach the critical point. Now, um, near the critical point there is a correlation length of the system psi which is and this psi scales with the correlation time in this particular way. So, psi t correlation time scales as correlation length to the power z. So, z is called the dynamical critical exponent. Also, the psi uh, diverges when you approach the critical um, temperature as t minus t c to some power minus t. So, there are two critical exponents which have shown up here uh, nu the correlation length exponent and z which is the dynamical critical exponent. Now, from these uh, equations you can show that xi to the power z is xi to the power minus 1 by nu times tau and so from that you can show that xi goes as tau to some power. Now, if you are in d dimensions and uh, let us say the defects that you are producing are point defects. Um, then the volume associated with the point defect is xi to the power d right. So, each defect it can be associated with the correlation length xi and the number of dimensions is d. So, there is a volume which is xi to the power d. Now, if the volume associated with one defect is v then the density of defects is 1 over v and you can work this out from here very easily. So, you find that the density of defects scales as 1 over tau to the power d nu over z nu plus 1. We will see that ok, because we will do a more detailed derivation of defects in, in one particular model which is the transverse fieldizing model ok. Uh, so, this is the most important result of this talk ok that you have this power law between the density of defects and the quenching time and uh, it is a scaling law and the exponent depends on three things the dimensionality of the space d, the uh, correlation length exponent nu and the critical uh, the dynamical critical exponent z. Now, interestingly it turns out that the same kind of scaling law holds if you quench across a quantum critical point at zero temperature. So, this was a classical system that I discussed where you quench across a critical temperature 
But now I'll tell you about what happens when you quench a quantum system across what is called a quantum critical point. Oh yeah. Yeah, so for example, if you calculated something like a correlation function in time, it would decay with that correlation time. So T C it blows up, right? So the correlation length blows up as T minus T C to the minus mu and the correlation time blows up as T minus T C to the power minus mu Z. This one. Now that is a formula which is relevant for quenching. If you are, you are asking about the divergence with, as we approach the critical time, so that you see from this line. Okay. This formula I am using just to give you an idea of what happens when you are quenching the system. So the meaning of the critical exponent is given in this line, not that line. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. So that's uh, costless thalus is kind of a singular limit of this where um, I forget now um, mu goes to infinity or something. It's, it's a particular limit of this. Yeah. yeah. Tau is exactly the rate at which you're quenching the system. So so that you can see here, t minus t c is t over tau. So you're varying the temperature in time, and so you cross the critical temperature at linearly in time, and the rate at which you're crossing the critical temperature is one by tau. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. So what's a quantum critical point? So a quantum system at zero temperature, namely in its ground state. Uh, may undergo a phase transition as some parameter gamma in the Hamiltonian is varied. Um, so this is all happening at zero temperature. It's completely different from the th phase transition, finite temperature phase transition of the classical system. Though you can sometimes map one to the other. So let's say that very generally, let's say gamma is the parameter that you're varying to go across the quantum critical point. Let's say gamma is equal to gamma c is the quantum critical point, so that the system is ordered if gamma is less than gamma c disorder if, it, if gamma is more than gamma c. Um, so let's say uh, m denotes the order parameter field. So for example, in a magnet, this would be the magnetization at some point. In a super uh, fluid, it will be the, um, you know, the Bose condensate order parameter and so on. Okay, so the expected value of this in the ground state is, um, let's denote this by m. So m is not zero if you are in the ordered phase, gamma less than gamma c, and it's zero if gamma is bigger than gamma c. Okay. Um, so uh, let's take a particular example. So the Ising model in a transverse field in one dimension, this is going to be our favorite example, which we'll discuss in many different calculations. So it's a one-dimensional model where you have this Pauli matrices. So you have spin half sitting at the different points of a chain in one dimension. So there is first of all an Ising interaction between nearest neighbors, sigma z, n, sigma z, n plus 1. So n is the, the index of the site. Plus there is a transverse field, sigma x, which is proportional to gamma. So gamma is the strength of the transverse field. So if you didn't have this gamma, then this would be a classical model. It's just the Ising model. But when you introduce this transverse field, then it's really a quantum model because the sigma z and sigma x's don't commute. Okay, so you have to do something to, um, something more complicated to find the energy levels of this Hamiltonian. Now you can show, and we are actually going to show this, and we can do this in more detail in the tutorial, that this system has a quantum critical point at gamma c equal to 1. And it turns out that this system is actually related to the finite temperature critical point of the classicalizing model in two dimensions, which is solved by Ansaga. So this happens actually quite often that a classical system which has a phase transition at finite temperature T, classical system in D dimensions is often related to a quantum system in D minus 1 dimensions which has a finite, which has a phase transition at zero temperature but as a function of some parameter. Okay. So there is a mapping that you can do from a 2D classicalizing model to this one dimensional quantum model 
where the role of temperature in the classical Ising model in two dimensions is played by gamma in the one dimensional quantum model. So, I won't show that mapping here, but it, it exists and it's a part of a general relation between D dimensional classical models and D minus one dimensional quantum models. Now, let's try to understand uh, this phase transition uh, a little bit pictorially. So, for gamma equal to zero, it's clear that um, all the sigma z's want to line up, right, to, so as to minimize this energy. Now, they can line up uh, either by having all the sigma z's equal to plus one at all sides or all of them equal to minus one at all sides. So, the ground state of this system has ferromagnetic order because all the sigma z's are lined up. Uh, so, in this case, the order parameter uh, is one at gamma equal to zero. On the other hand, if gamma equal to infinity, then all the spins, uh, so this second term is the most important and then all the spins will want to line up in the x direction and in this case, there is only one ground state, they are all lined up in the x direction, whereas at gamma equal to 0, there are two ground states given by sigma z plus 1 and minus 1. So, now what happens is gamma goes from 0 to infinity is that it crosses a critical point at some gamma c and this order parameter which is the expected value of sigma z goes from 1 at gamma equal to 0 to 0 at as gamma equal to gamma c and after that it remains 0. Okay, so that is kind of the pictorial uh, view of this phase transition. Okay, so, this is a continuous phase transition. Um, so, a few things now about the critical exponents. So, if you look at the two spin correlation function, so sigma z at the site 0 and sigma z site n, this two spin correlation minus let us subtract this uh, single spin expected value squared so that you know we subtract this so that this thing actually goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Because as n goes to infinity, this actually breaks up into product of these two and that will cancel this guy. So, this object always goes to 0, whether you are in the ordered phase or the disordered phase. Uh, this goes to 0 exponentially as e to the power minus some n by xi, very large n. And this correlation length xi diverges as you approach the quantum critical point as gamma minus gamma c to some minus n. Okay, so that is the definition of one of the critical exponents nu in this problem. Now, where do you get the other exponent z that I talked about? So, that to get that you have to look at the spectrum of the low lying excitations. So, let us say they have an energy which is omega of k. So, in this entire talk, I think almost everywhere Planck's constant is 1. Okay. So, the energy is h cross omega, but that is just omega. Now, exactly at the critical point, gamma equal to gamma c, this omega will vanish at some momentum k c as k minus k c to the power z. Okay. So, you remember that in the classical model, there is a, re a scaling relation between the correlation time and the correlation length. One of them was the z power of the other one. So, in the quantum model that is replaced by this, that the energy is scale as momentum to the power z. Okay. It is very similar time versus um, distance and here omega versus momentum, energy versus momentum. Um, so, by the way, so there is bo both a concept of a critical point in parameter gamma c as well as a critical momentum case. Okay. So, the, mom the energy vanishes near the critical moment. Uh, now, the gap uh, which is omega k c between the ground state and the first excited state vanishes as gamma minus gamma c to the power z u. Uh, you can actually sort of understand this by combining this statement and that statement. So, these relations define two critical exponents nu and z. Now, there are of course, many other critical exponents as you know, right. Um, I am sure you all know about uh, critical phenomena to some extent. Uh, one of the critical exponents that you may be aware of is the expected value of sigma z, just the order parameter. How does that go to 0 when you approach the critical point from the ordered side? That goes as gamma c minus gamma to the 1 8 um, and there are other critical exponents, but we do not need this right now. Okay, we will need them later if I get to that point. So, right now we only need this z and nu. Now, for the transverse field Ising model, it turns out that this omega is known exactly and we will actually go through the solution of this. How do we know this omega exactly? And this is the formula for it and from this you can read off that the critical um, 
value of gamma is 1 and kc is pi. So that's where omega is 0. And now you can do two things. One is you can see how does it go to 0 with gamma minus gamma c if you're sitting exactly at k equal to kc or how does it go to 0 as k minus kc if gamma is exactly equal to gamma c. And so these two together will give you z and nu. And so if you do all that, just from the simple formula, you can find that the critical exponents of this model are z equal to 1 and nu equal to 1. Okay. Okay, so before I go on, so um, remember z is 1 and nu is 1. So the kibble zurek formula here and d is 1, this is a one dimensional model. So it will give you 1 over square root of tau. Okay, so let's go on. Um, okay, so this is again a picture of what I said earlier. For gamma going to infinity, ground state has all the spins lined up in the this direction, and the lowest excited state has a spin pointing in the wrong direction. For gamma going to zero, the ground states are these two ferromagnetic states, and the lowest excited state is here is not actually a state where one of the spins is pointing the wrong way, but a domain wall where you have one ground state on the left all up and a different ground state on the right all down. This actually has half the energy of flipping just one spin. So this is an example of a defect. Okay. Uh, it's actually a topological defect because if you look at the order parameter, it's plus one on this side, minus one on this side and goes through zero. Okay. So this is like this plot of M of X mass parameter versus the coordinate that uh, Jaydeep was talking about. Okay. So what happens if we uh, now change gamma in time? So this is a, you know, time dependent problem that we are talking about. If you change it in time from infinity to zero in some time tau, then uh, for gamma equal to zero, these are the ground states. But due to this quenching, the act state that you'll actually approach when gamma goes to zero will have a few defects. Uh, it'll become a little more clear why you get defects, but let's just take my word for it. You will actually see a few defects. So instead of uh, being in one of the two ground states at gamma equal to zero, you'll find, um, you know, I'll, either you'll see domain walls like that, or you'll see single spins turned the wrong way in the middle of one of the ground states, and so on. Okay. So these are the typical kinds of defects that you'll see in this problem. Some of these defects are topological, like this domain wall, while others are not. This one is really not a topological defect. You can think of it as a combination of two domain walls which have come really close to each other. But so there are different kinds of defects, topological or non-topological. The kibble zurek scaling law that I tell you, I told you about, that actually just tells you about the total number of defects that you produce. It doesn't distinguish between topological and non-topological. We need something better to distinguish between the two that, but we have not figured that out yet. So it is clear what, what we mean by defects in this model? Yeah. Um, so this is, uh, so I'm calling a domain wall as a topological defect because it has two different ground states on the two sides. So if you think of the order parameter, it's actually changing sign from one side to the other. Whereas if you look at this one, um, the order parameter has the same sign on the two sides. All it's doing is that it's just changing sign and then going back. So if something changes sign, I call that a topological thing. Right? So this this kind of thing you have seen in some earlier lectures. Um, the other way of seeing why this is topological is that so if you take this defect, you can't remove this defect by doing anything locally. Because you have two different ground states on the two sides. And so if you just do something locally, you'll still have two different ground states on the two sides. But here, if you just flip over this one, then you have the same ground state everywhere. So you can uh, remove this defect by doing something local. Whereas this thing you can't do by some any local transformation. So that's um, that's what makes this topological and that other one is not topological. So what we are going to calculate now is how does this defect density depend on the quenching time tau in this model. Um, so we are going to consider a linear quench. So gamma is going to be minus t by tau and t goes from minus infinity to zero. So 
So we are starting at t equal to minus infinity with gamma very large. So we are in the completely disordered phase. All the spins are pointing in the x direction. And then at t equal to 0, we are going to end at gamma equal to 0. So the critical point is at gamma equal to 1. Okay, so we cross it somewhere between minus infinity and 0. Okay. And we are going to see how many um, defects are produced. So let me first tell you the main result and a simple reason for it and then we will actually derive it in detail. So the main result is that uh, for this model, if tau is much larger than the inverse of the bandwidth, okay, so we will see what the bandwidth is, but we are going to calculate the spectrum of low energy excitations and the range of that spectrum, you know, top minus the bottom, that range is what I am going to call the bandwidth. So if tau is much larger than the inverse of the bandwidth, then we will see that the density of defects n scales is 1 over root tau. So that is going to be our main result today. Um, the reason why this happens is that when you quench across a quantum critical point, you find that there are necessarily a number of low energy modes. So remember that a quantum critical point is where the gap in the system goes to 0. So away from the critical point, the system is gap. Whether you are in the ordered phase or disordered phase, it does not matter, it is gap. But if at the critical point, the gap closes. And so if you are quenching across that point, there are a lot of low, low energy modes. And for these, the quenching is not adiabatic. So this will become more clear when we do that calculation. And it, this, these modes are what give rise to the defects. Okay, so now we are going to discuss the solution of the transverse field Ising model. So how many of you have seen this before? probably still worth it because about half of you have not seen this. Um, so this model that I just told you about um, can be solved exactly by this uh, thing called the jordan wigner transformation which maps spin halves to fermions. Okay. Um, so this discussed, so this actually cooked up I think in this, well it must have been cooked up by Jordan and Wigner but it's really used in this model by Lieb, Schulz and Matthews. And there's a very, very nice review article where a lot of these things are discussed. So the idea is the following, that a spin half has two states at every site, right? And a fermion, by fermion here I mean a spinless fermion. So it's fermion with no other degree of freedom. A fermion also has two states per site. Either the state, site can have no fermions or it can have one fermion. So at least the uh, number of states match, right? A spin half and a spinless fermion match. So from that point of view, it's maybe not completely surprising that you can do this mapping. However, this mapping really only works properly in one dimension. Okay, it I mean, it, you can do it in any dimension, but in higher dimensions, generally not useful, uh, except for the Kitaev model, which is an exceptional thing that I'll talk about. So it's most useful this mapping in one dimension. So it goes like this. So you have, so remember, you have a chain of spin halves. So what you do is that, uh, let's say this chain starts at minus infinity. Okay. So you have, you define a product of a st string of sigma z's from minus infinity up to the site n minus 1. And then you have a sigma n plus. Remember sigma n plus is um, what, sigma n x plus i sigma n y. Um, so you define this object and let's call this a n. Um, the Hermitian conjugate of this is again the string of sigma z's, that's already Hermitian, times sigma n minus. Okay. Now you can show that uh, these a's and a daggers actually are fermionic operators. Okay, this is really astonishing that you started with some spin variables which are, uh, which commute with each other at different sites, but by defining something like this, you produce objects which are fermionic. What I mean by fermionic is that a anti-commutes with a m, anti-commutes with a n at different sites, at all sites in fact, and a m with a n dagger gives you 1 if m is equal to n and 0 otherwise. Okay, so this is a kind of standard fermionic anti-commutation relation. The reason this works is that uh, if you calculate this, you will discover that um, because sigma plus at one site commutes with, anti-commutes with sigma z at the same site, um, that is what gives rise to this problem. So the string of sigma z is very important. This is what um, gives you these objects which anti-commute with each other at different sites. So 
So these operators create an annihilate spinless fermion. So I have also now gone over to second quantized notation. Now in terms of the fermion operator, you can take this Hamiltonian and you discover that it has this form. So, um, so that, that's actually a simple calculation to do. Uh, you notice there are various kinds of terms here. There are terms like A dagger A at the same site. So these are like um, on-site terms, chemical potential kind of terms. Um, so it's just the counting the number of fermions at the site. Then there are the hopping terms. A dagger n plus 1 an, which hops the fermion from n to n plus 1, and its emission conjugate. Then you have these very strange terms, a dagger n, a dagger n plus 1. So this creates a pair of fermions at n and n plus 1, and its emission conjugate, conjugate annihilates it. So this kind of looks like a superconducting term, right? You can create or annihilate Cooper pairs on neighboring sites. Okay. So this is actually um, also a model. Uh, for uh, what is called a P-wave superconductor in one dimension. Um, okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Yeah. What happens to the? Uh, yeah, I'm assuming periodic boundary condition. Okay. Um, so kind of. Uh, Rather subtle things happen at the boundary, which I'm glossing over right now. Maybe um, in the second talk, I'll get to what happens to the boundary. Okay. So it turns out that, so let me just tell you quickly what happens at the boundary. So if you look at the last coupling between the, the system goes from one to capital N number of sites. If you look at the coupling between the nth site and the first site, you find that that is not just like this. It has an extra phase. Okay. And the extra phase is plus one or minus one depending on whether the number of fermions is even or odd. Okay. So you get this extra term right at the boundary. But it's kind of subtle. Okay. Uh, most of the time it won't make any difference to us because it's just one term out of n terms. Uh, but sometimes it makes a difference. It certainly makes a difference to the spectrum for finite systems. Okay. Because it affects the quantization of the momentum, whether you have periodic or anti-periodic boundary. So now you define the Fourier transforms like this, a k n, uh, which is sum over a n e to the minus i k n. This root n is for normalization, and uh, this is the inverse Fourier transform. So in terms of this Fourier transform, the Hamiltonian becomes this. Okay. So you notice that in this Hamiltonian, uh, you have again two kinds of terms, a dagger k a k, which is like a number conserving quantity, a dagger a. Uh, it just counts the number of um, fermions with momentum k, and then a similar term or a momentum minus k. Then you get this term which couples a k with a minus k. And again, this is a kind of a superconducting term. Right? You've got a pair of creation or annihilation operators which couple opposite momenta, which is exactly the way Cooper pair terms are supposed to be. Opposite momenta. There is no spin here. So this is that's why it's a P-wave superconductor. Okay, the spin, if you can imagine there's the spin is polarized or you can forget about the spin. Okay. Now, because k and minus k are coupled, um, so I'm just here. I've written the sum only from zero to pi because you know k and minus k automatically appears. In this. Okay, so here's the Hamiltonian, and as I said, it decouples into non-interacting fermions with the momentum plus minus k. Everything is non-interacting because it's completely quadratic in terms of the fermion operator. Now, for each pair of momentum plus minus k, there are four states. Right? There's an empty state which has no fermions. There's a state with one fermion with momentum k, state with one fermion with momentum minus k, and then a two fermion state with both momentum plus k and minus k. Now, if you take this Hamiltonian, so just look at one particular set of momentum plus minus k. So forget about the sum over k. For this Hamiltonian, you can see that the one fermion states have zero energy, while the states which are empty and two fermions they are governed by 2 by 2 Hamiltonian given here. And they have energies, um, you can work out the energies of this, you'll find that they have an energy, one of them, um, yeah, one of them is higher than zero energy, one of them is lower than zero energy. Okay. Um, so the ground state lies in this two-dimensional subspace, 
and the energy spectrum is given by this. You can just read this off directly from here. I have actually shifted a variable. So I think I have taken out a factor of minus 2 gamma plus cos k here. If you take that out, then you get a minus 2 gamma plus cos k here and plus 2 gamma cos k. Gamma plus cos k. So there is a term proportional to sigma z and a term proportional to sigma x. And you know the eigenvalues of that is, you know, if you have a sigma z plus b sigma x, the eigenvalues are plus minus square root of a squared plus b squared. So that's where you get the spectrum. Okay. Now, what happens when you change this gamma in time? Because this is what we are after, right? We are, gamma is the parameter that we are going to vary in time. So, uh, you can see that uh, the one fermion states, they just, they are stuck at zero energy. So, they don't move. But the energy of the other two states move. And only these two can mix with each other because the gamma is showing up in this Hamiltonian and, and gamma is a function of time. So, only these two states can mix with each other. So, even though there are four states, really there are only two states which are important in this problem. Okay, so we have to just deal with a two level system. And for this particular form of variation of gamma with time, the Hamiltonian is given by this. So now the question is, uh, so I have now put it in this form of sigma z times this plus sigma x times 2 sin. So the question is, you start in the ground state of the system at t equals minus infinity. And then, you, time of course varies, you don't have to do anything, time varies by itself. What, what is the state that we reach at t equals 0? So, uh, so this is a two-level problem where something is varying linearly in time. So, this is a very famous problem. It's called the Landau-Zener problem, um, solved by Zener and Landau independently, both in 1932 by some amazing coincidence. Um, um, so, Landau's original paper is um, not easy to get hold of, but it's there in, this, in his book on quantum mechanics. So, if you just leave out a lot of parameters here and come to the bare essentials, this is the problem. You have a two level system, the diagonal element proportional to sigma z varies with time as t by tau, the off diagonal element is constant and uh, we want to know what is the uh, probability of starting in the ground state at t equal to minus t and ending up in a, either the ground state or the excited state at t equal to plus t. So, that is the basic problem. So, first of all, let look at the instantaneous eigenvalues of this. So, I sh we shouldn't call these energy levels because, you know, if the Hamilton is varying in time, it doesn't really make sense to call its eigenvalues energy levels. But you can call them instantaneous eigenvalues. So, they have these sh forms. Um, so, at t equals minus infinity, the ground state is here and you can see from here that at t equals minus infinity, the ground state is 1, 0 and the excited state is 0, 1. When t goes to plus infinity, it's the other way. The ground state is uh, 0, 1 and the excited state is 1, 0. So, we want to know, uh, if you start in the ground state at minus infinity, what is the probability p of going to the excited state at plus infinity and the probability 1 minus p of going remaining in the ground state at plus infinity. These two are actually separated by a gap which is 2b, right? At time t equal to 0, there is a gap Okay, so here is the result that the probability of ending in the excited state at t equal to infinity is given by p equal to e to the power minus pi b squared tau. Okay. This is a really remarkable formula because this is the exact result. There are no factors in front. This is it. So this is what Landau and Zener derived. Actually, Zener got it absolutely correctly. Landau actually made a mistake of 2 pi in the exponential, but it was corrected by Zener. Um, okay, let's look at some particular limits of this to see that this works out fine. So, if what happens if tau is um, 0? Okay, let's go back here. If tau is 0, um, do you think you are going across this very fast or very slowly? Very fast, right? Tau is the rate, I mean tau is the time you take to go from here to here. Right? So, if tau is 0, it is like a sudden quench. Okay? If you do a sudden quench, 
then um, do you think you'll uh, stay in the ground state or end up in the excited state? Excited state, because the wave function is the same. The ground state here and the excited state there have exactly the same wave function, 0, 1. And so if you quench very fast, the system really doesn't have any time to react. So it just stays in the same state. Okay. So if you start here, you end up there. So P should be 1 if tau is 0. Okay. So that's, that's fine. Tau is 0 as P is 1. If tau is infinity, that's adiabatic, right? You're changing very, very slowly and there's a gap. So you should just stay in the ground state. That's the adiabatic theorem of quantum mechanics. So if tau goes to infinity, P should be 0. So that's also correct. Tau is infinity, P is 0. Okay, now this is uh, the result um, if you really start at minus infinity and go to plus infinity. But if you are, uh, if you start at some finite negative time and go to some finite positive time, you don't get this formula. You get something else which is 1 over P to the power 4 tau squared. So of course there is a crossover between this formula and that formula as you go to very large times in the past and in the future. And the crossover happens when the initial and final times are of the order of P, P tau. This you can figure out just on dimensional grounds. Okay. Um, so the probability of ending in the excited state is this and I have already told you about why it has these particular limits. Now, this it is nice to have this result but in many of the generalizations that I will talk about you won't have an exact result like that. So it is useful to know why it has this particular form even if you don't know this exact result. So let me just show you that P must be a function of B root tau. So even if you don't know if it is like this, it is function of B root tau. Um, so that you know at least what is the scaling variable. So the Schrodinger equation is here. So this is what you have to solve. And so what you do is multiply throughout by root tau and redefine t prime is equal to t by root tau. Then you get an equation where uh, there is now just one single dimensionless parameter, which is b root tau. Okay. So, so now it is clear that since there is only one parameter, if you start at uh, the initial ground state, psi 1 equal to 1 at t prime equal to minus infinity, then the probability of excitation at t prime equal to plus infinity must be a function of just this parameter. And then on this general grounds, you know, um, adiabatic limit tau going to infinity and sudden quench tau going to 0, this, this probability should, must go to 0 as p root tau goes to infinity or 1 if p root tau goes to 0. And this is really all we need. We don't really need this exact form. Is this clear so far? No, 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 the scaling will come later. This is just, uh, you know, it's just a dimensional argument here. So, you look at various um, combinations of B and tau and see which combination will give you a equation with a single variable. And you find that you need B root. So this is, you know, the scaling law is something that comes later after this. Okay, so now we return to this Hamiltonian for the transverse sizing model given here. So the total defect density is now, so for each of these modes, when you vary gamma across the critical point, you have a pro probability of excitations, P of K. And so all you do to get the defect density is you integrate this probability over all the values of K from 0 to Is that fine? So you're just integrating the probability of excitation for each k over k. No, this counts everything. So this is the problem. This actually counts everything. And we have no way here of distinguishing between how many topological defects are produced and how many non-topological defects. Yeah. Yes, but it's for a single k. The Landau's inner formula is for a single k. Whereas to figure out whether something is topological or not, you have to look at what the defect looks like in real space, which is a combination of many different k's. So from here, this P of k is not clear whether you are producing something topological or not topological. Okay, so you have this integral to do. Um, now, uh, for large tau, okay, so what do I mean by large tau? So large tau means that it is much bigger than 1. So this is where we run into this condition that tau has to be much bigger than the inverse bandwidth. 
I should have told you what the bandwidth is. So, bandwidth is just the, you know, upper and lower values of maximum and minimum values of gamma, the difference between those. So, that's of the order of gamma. So, when tau is much larger than the inverse bandwidth, this integral you can see is dominated by contributions from k equal to 0 and pi, right, because that's where this is vanishing. Any other value of k, this is really small, e to the power minus a huge number is really small. So, the contributions only come from k equal to 0 and pi. And for around those points, you can do an expansion and it looks like a Gaussian integral around those points. So, this is just k squared. And so, you just do this Gaussian integral, you get 1 by root tau. So, that is the basic result that the scaling of the defect density is 1 by root tau. Now, um, just to understand this qualitatively, this power law arises because the quench took, took, took us across a quantum critical point where the energy vanished at some values of k, 0 and pi. And so, no matter how slowly we quench across this point, there are low energy modes with energies less than this, for which the quenching is not adiabatic. Okay, so, so let me just say this differently. Um, you know, if you have a, if you have a two level system with a gap between them and you quench very, very slowly compared to the, so the quenching rate is much less than the gap, then you are in the adiabatic limit, right, and you will not produce any defects. But the point about a quantum critical point is that no matter how slowly you are quenching, you can always find some modes for which the gap is less than the quenching rate. And then for those modes, this is, process will not be adiabatic. And those modes contribute to the production of defects. So that is why the quantum critical point is important. If you went across some arbitrary point where the gap is not closing, then uh, the density of defects would go to zero exponentially, e to the power minus tau kind of you only get a power law because you are going across a quantum critical point where the gap has, is closing. Because there are modes there for which the quenching is not adiabatic. So, so any questions so far? Yeah. So, I will discuss many generalizations of this. What happens for nonlinear quenching? What happens in higher dimensions and so on? All right. Um, so, how am I doing on time? I am supposed to do, yeah, um, let me do a quick calculation. I am supposed to do 30 slides per talk. Um, so, that is about 3 minutes per slide. Yes, I am doing fine. Otherwise, I will just start skipping some slides. Um, so, here, here again is a hand waving derivation. So, I gave a hand waving derivation earlier for a classical system going across a critical temperature. This is a similar hand waving derivation for a quantum critical point for a system in d dimensions with some critical exponents mu and z. So, by analogy with the two level thing that I just showed you, let us say that the Hamiltonian is of this form that you have a delta E in the, you know, delta E times sigma z, the diagonal terms, where del delta E times sin t, so that it changes sign when t, the time crosses 0. And delta E goes as gamma minus gamma c to the power z nu. This we have seen. This is what happens near a quantum critical point. And we are quenching gamma, so that gamma minus gamma c is t by tau. Okay. So, that is what sits on the diagonal entries. The off diagonal entries, are, uh, are k to the power z. So, that also we have seen earlier. So, now we just do a scaling argument just as before. So, that is why I gave you this scaling, scaling argument in the previous slide. So, you, you see that, you know, you look at what uh, power of tau you have to multiply throughout by so that, you know, you end up with a single dimensionless parameter. So, you discover that you have to actually multiply the Schrodinger equation by tau to the power z nu over z nu plus 1 and redefine the time t to t prime in this way. Then you will discover that you get the Schrodinger equation where there is a single parameter. Um, sorry, you get a Schrodinger equation where there is k times a parameter like this. And so, the probability of ending in the excited state is given by some function of this combination. Okay. So, I am skipping some steps here, but it is basically exactly the same kind of scaling that we saw earlier. 
And we don't need to know what this function is. All that we need to know is that it's a function of this combination. And it goes to um, 0 if tau goes to infinity and it goes to 1 if tau goes to 0. That's really all we need to know. Then the density of defects is given by the integral of pk over all k. And this is a d-dimensional integral if you're in d-dimensions. And again, a dimensional argument, you know, d, d dk is like k to the power d minus 1 times dk. Just a dimensional argument will tell you that you get a formula like this. Okay. So there's a general formula for kibble zurek in any dimension D with these critical exponents there in it. So you really need, don't need to know any of the details of this two-level system to get this formula. And for D equals nu equals Z equals 1, which is true for the transverse field Ising model, you get 1 over root tau. Okay. Now this derivation still used um, two level systems, but even that's not necessary. Okay. So there's this argument by given by Paul Kovnikov very early in this, um, you know, in this game, uh, where if you take a translation invariant system, no disorder, then he derived this result um, without assuming any two level system, which is good, you know, because you know, generally the world is not full of two level systems. All that he used is first order perturbation theory. So you're varying something in time. So you have to use first order perturbation theory to calculate the probability of excitations. And uh, some scaling argument for the dispersion of the low lying excitation that, as we have done. So K is a good corner number because it's translation invariant. And then the derivative of this matrix element um, with respect to this parameter gamma that you're varying. Okay. So the existence of two level system is not necessary. And then, um, you know, from this you can show that you can get the kibble zurek law. So again, the defects are produced by region and moment of space with this volume, k to the power d, where um, gamma minus gamma c tau, so it's only produced when you are very close to the critical point. So you have to be, how close do you have to be to the critical point? You have to be in this range. Okay. It's very similar to the argument I gave earlier for, you know, the finite temperature transition. So I'm just going over this quickly. Yeah. Non-interacting is necessary, yes. Because I, at some point I'll tell you what happens in a Luttinger liquid. And then you'll find that uh, the scaling law changes there. Okay, so defects are produced during this time interval. And um, this K scales like this. So that's just the, comes from the critical exponent and omega scales with K as like this. So then combining all this, you find that the density of defects goes as 1 over tau to the power d nu over z. Now, this is the general um, defect scaling law. However, it breaks down at um, if the dimensionality is too large. Okay, this was also pointed out in this paper by Paul Uh If D is more than this, then you'll see that um, you actually get contributions to defect density from all momenta. So, remember here that only certain momenta, which are the ones which are becoming almost gapless, contribute to the defect density. But if D is more than this, you find that all momenta contribute, not just small momenta. And this has to do with what I told you about the Landau's inner problem earlier, that if you don't grow between minus to infinity, you don't get this exponential formula, you get this power law formula. Um, uh, so this happens because in practice gamma minus gamma c it only between, goes between some finite values. It doesn't really go from minus to plus infinity. And so the excitation probability is then of order 1 by tau squared. So if you look at this formula and you keep increasing tau, this will, the power will keep increasing till it reaches 2 and then it saturates at 2. Once when you go beyond that, it doesn't increase anymore. Okay, so there's the kibble zure scaling relation. So what I'm going to do now is tell you about many possible generalizations of the scaling relation. Uh, many, many ways in which uh, this can change. Um, so today I'll tell you about uh, maybe just the first two. So what happens when you quench across a gapless surface? So you know, as I told you, in the transverse fieldizing model, there's a gapless momentum, Kc, which is 0 or pi. But in general, you can have a gapless surface in moment of space if you are in a higher dimensional model. 
So, what happens to this scaling relation then? Or what happens when you quench along a critical line? So, here we crossed a critical point, but you can have a critical line. You want to see what happens there. Then what happens if you quench non-linearly? So, instead of quenching across the critical point as linearly in T, you quench as T to some power alpha. What happens there? So, you will see that in all these cases, this uh, scaling relation is modified. First of all, uh, let's look at a gapless surface. So, suppose that at the critical point gamma equal to gamma c, the energy vanishes on a surface of d minus m dimensions rather than at an isolated point in k space. So, then the momentum integration which appears in the expression for the defect density, it's over m dimensions instead of all the d dimensions. No, 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 sorry. This is a different M. So, this is a case where, uh, so, so we are going to discuss a model called the Kitaev model in two dimensions where D is 2 and there you will discover, you will discover that there is, there are gapless uh, phases there and in, at any point in the gapless phase, the energy vanishes at a whole, at a line of points in K space. So, then M is 1. So, it basically tells you that Instead of the energy vanishing at one point, it vanishes along a line. So, basically d minus m is the number of dimensions in momentum space on which the energy vanishes. Okay. So, it's just an integer. Okay. But because it vanishes along a dimension, uh, a d minus m dimensional space, you have to integrate over the remaining m uh, coordinates. So, that's why this integral, so in the earlier picture, you had this integral of integral over d dimensions of k. So, that now changes to an integral over m dimensions of k. So, your um, defect density will change like this. So, basically instead of d here you will get m. So, for every k, p k is the probability of ex going ending up in the excited state. Yeah, it is the excitation probability. That's, that's exactly correct. So, if you are exactly on the gapless line, the density of defects there is 1 uh, on any of these points. But it is a lower dimensional space, right? Your full space is d dimensional and this is a lower dimensional space. So, that surface by itself does not contribute to the defect density. So, what you have to do is integrate close to the surface, right? So, 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 where so, wherever the gap is small, not necessarily 0, but where it is small, you integrate over all those regions and that is what gives you this law. See, I mean it is like this, I, suppose the system is two dimensional, you have to do a two dimensional integral to get the density of defects. Now, it may happen that on one particular line in that two dimension, the density of defects is 1, but a line is a set of measures 0, right, in two dimensions. So, just having the line is not enough to give you a finite density of defects. So, you have to integrate over the entire space and it will get a contribution not just from the line, but all the points close to the line. So, that is this integral dmk. Okay. So, um, so this is kind of something that I just said theoretically. So, now I am going to show you a model where this really happens. Okay. So, this is a Kitaev model, which is a model in two dimensions where m is 1, u and z are both 1. So, we get n equal to 1 by root tau which is different from what would have happened if you just put d here. You know, if you just took the traditional Kibble-Zurek scaling, you would put d here and you will get 1 over tau, but you actually get 1 by root tau. Okay. So, now the Kitaev model. Okay. So, now, um, so next 10 minutes or so, I am just going to tell you about the Kitaev model. So, forget about this defect density and quenching and all. This is a really great model, okay. It is absolutely fantastic and this is a model that you should know about, at least, you know, um, theoretically. I, well, there are even experimental systems where this is beginning to be probed, okay. Um, sorry? Yeah. 
Yeah. So why? You, okay. So the point is that the other. So we are integrating over m dimensions. Other d minus m dimensions. Yeah, it's gapless. So uh, that doesn't give you anything special. Okay. It it, it basically gives. Uh, yeah. So it basically contributes zero to the defect density. a little confused here. So it's like saying, um, so in the transverse field Ising model, you know, you do this integral over k, right? To get, yeah, so one second. So you do this integral over k to get the defect density. But the gap is zero only at k equal to zero. But you don't keep k equal to zero only. Right? Yep. Yeah, that's just a point. So it's the same story here, that it vanishes on a surface, but a surface is just a, you know, it says sort of a set of measures zero, right, compared to the full volume. Right? It's like just one single surface in a higher dimensional space. So a single surface in a higher dimensional space will not make any contribution. So you have to integrate over everything. So, okay, there are the other d minus m dim things here. That integration is also there, but that just contributes a constant. Okay, okay maybe that will make it more clear. So there is there is an integral over the other d minus m dimensions. Okay, so you can multiply this by that integral, but that integral just gives you a constant. So that will multiply this thing by some constant. Okay, so the power law only comes from this. The integral over the d minus m dimension just multiplies by some constant. Okay, so the Kitai model is one of the very very few models known in two dimensions which is exactly solvable. And uh, it has all kinds of fancy things, you know, uh, the low energy excitations are Majorana fermions. And all kinds of things happen in this model. Um, but for us, it's just a nice model to play with. Okay? And it's a spin half model on a honeycomb lattice. And you'll see that it can be exactly solved using the jordan wigner transformation, which is quite surprising because usually the jordan wigner transformation, it can be done in any dimension. But the Hamiltonian uh, typically behaves very badly in higher dimensions due to the Jordan Wigner. But in the Kitai model, because of the particular structure it has, it turns out it can be solved exactly using the Jordan Wigner transformation. Okay, so here's the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is extremely strange looking. Right? So you have a honeycomb lattice, and this lattice has three kinds of bonds, right? So there are vertical bonds which I'll call Z. Then there are these bonds at an angle, so this bond going up like this, I'll call it the X bond, and this bond I'll call the Y bond. So then the coupling between the nearest neighbors is like this, that on the X bond is J1 sigma X sigma X. Y bond is J2 sigma Y sigma Y, and Z bond is J3 sigma Z sigma Y. Um, so extremely anisotropic, right? It's definitely not the Heisenberg interaction, which is a sigma dot sigma. It's extremely anisotropic. It's not Ising either, because depending on the bond, different components of sigma interact with each other. Um, it turns out that, uh, that, you know, systems are, materials actually emerging now, which are roughly described by this kind of model. Okay, so it's not, uh, when Kitar proposed it, it looked like a really an artificial model, but it's not really so anymore. Uh, we can assume without losing any, any generality that all these things are positive because you can change their sign by some unitary transformation. So the model is clear. Um, now the honeycomb lattice actually has um, is a bipartite lattice, right? So, for example, if you look at the vertical bonds, the upper, let's say the top side, I call it an A side, and the bottom side I call it a B side. So this lattice, entire lattice has two sublattices, which are A and B. Okay. Bipartite means that the A sites only couple to the B sites and vice versa. Okay. So now uh, the statement is that this can be solved exactly by mapping it to Majorana fermions by a Jordan-Wigner transformation. So the mapping, 
goes like this. So whenever you want to go from spin halves to uh, fermions, um, I'll explain the word Majorana in a second. Whenever you go from spin halves to fermions, you remember that you have to do something special to make the operators anti-commute with each other, right? Because spin halves by themselves commute at different sides. Uh, so in the transverse field Ising model, the way you did that is by having the string of sigma z's. So you need a string like that here also. But there's a two-dimensional model. So which way, how do you choose the string? So there are many ways of choosing the string. So one way of choosing the string is, let's say we have a finite lattice. So you take a product of sigma z's starting, let's say, from the top left corner. And then you take a product going along that top row. Then you come down, then you take a product going along the second row. So you go along the top row from left to right, second row from right to left, and then third row from left to right, and so on. Till you get to the site before the site that you're interested in, just like in the transverse field Ising model. Okay, so An is a product from, let's say, minus infinity just means the top left corner of the lattice, to the site that you're interested in, that's the site before that, product of sigma z's. So that's the jordan wigner string of sigma z. And then you end up with a sigma y or a sigma x, depending on whether the number of the chain is even or odd. So let's say the top chain is number one, so it's odd. Next chain is number two, it's even, and so on. Vn is another operator which is a product over sigma z, ending with sigma x or sigma y, depending on whether the chain number is even or odd. So, uh, you know, you have two different a's and b's, no matter which chain you're on. One of them will have a sigma y, the other will have a sigma x. Then you can check that these satisfy these anti-commutation relations. Okay. So they're fermionic. But there's more. They're actually uh, Hermitian. Remember, I'm actually putting sigma y, sigma x, not sigma plus and sigma minus. So these are actually Hermitian as they stand. So these are these very strange operators. They are fermionic in terms of anti-commutation relations, but they're also Hermitian. A dagger is the same as A, okay? So there's no separate creation and annihilation operators here. Okay, so that's why they're called Majorana Fermions because they're Hermitian. Um, so I've already told you how to choose the string. Um, now, in terms of those operators A and B, then you discover that xx and yy interactions are local. So let's go back to this picture. So remember the string is going like this. It's just going along the chains, right? So if you have an interaction like j1 or j2, which is along, you know, it's between two sides on the same chain. So it's just between nearest neighbors. The string is also going along the chain. So it's not hard to see that an interaction between two spin halves here is also an interaction between two Majorana fermions. So something which is local in terms of spin-spin interactions is also local in terms of fermion-fermion interactions. So that's what happens for J1 and J2. Now, the ZZ interaction is a troublesome thing, right? This would normally become non-local and fourth order in the fermion operator. Okay, let's see how is that is. So let's say you have an interaction between this Z and this Z. I mean, this spin here and this spin here. If you write that in terms of fermions, um, the fermion here has a string going like that. The fermion here has, a, has an extra bit of string going like that and then coming back. So the interaction between these two spins will involve an interaction between these two fermions times the string which goes from here to here. Okay? And so somewhere, if you're in deep inside the system, you'll have the string left over, which is an enormous string, which goes from one side to the end of that chain and comes back on the other chain. So it'll, so something which was nearest neighbor spin-spin interaction becomes an interaction between two fermions, uh, which is, uh, which has this string which is extremely non-local. It runs over a huge distance. Not only that, the interaction, uh, so A and B is sigma y, sigma x. So if you want to form sigma z, you have to multiply A and B. So a sigma z, sigma z interaction will be a multiplication of a, b here times a, b here. So it will be a four Fermi interaction. It will be a, b times a, b. Unlike the j1, j2 interactions, which are just a, b. They're just quadratic. 
So, the ZZ interactions typically are very bad. They are… they have this non-local Jordan-Wigner string and they have four fermions in there. So, that's why the Jordan-Wigner uh, transformation, though it can be done, is totally useless in two and higher dimensions because it has this… It gives you these very strange terms in the Hamiltonian when you convert from spin half to fermions. However, something fantastic happens in the Kitai model. So, normally the ZZ interaction would be non-local and quartic in the fermion operators, but in this model it remains local and only couples fermions on nearest neighbor sites because this model has a huge number of conserved quantities. Okay, so, where does that come from? So, this is the model. And the claim is that uh, this has a conserved quantity W associated with every hexagon. Okay. So, let's look at this. So, on this hexagon, the conserved quantity is this product of six Pauli matrices in this particular way. So, sigma 1, y, sigma 2, z, sigma 3x and so on. Why is this a conserved quantity? So, let's… let's see that this commutes with the Hamiltonian. Now, the Hamiltonian, for example, has a term on this 1, 2 bond which is xx. So, sigma 1 x x times sigma 2 x, but that commutes with this because sigma 1 x anti commutes with sigma 1 y, sigma 2 x also anti commutes with this. So, the product commutes with this. Uh, there is another term in the Hamilton which is sigma 1 y with sigma some 0 y, this bond, right? Sigma 1. That also commutes with this because this one has only sigma 1 y. So, like this, you can take every term in the Hamiltonian and you'll find that they, they all… every term in the Hamilton commutes with this. Now, this is only for this hexagon. You can define a similar thing on an, any other hexagon they, and that also commutes with the Hamiltonian. So, for every hexagon, there is a conserved quantity. Uh, this is a uh, omission operator. You can check that its square is 1. So, its eigenvalues are plus or minus 1. And so, there is a conserved quantity on every hexagon which is plus or minus 1. Also, the conserved quantity is the W's on different hexagons also commute with each other. That also you can check just from this. Okay, so this is a fantastic model which has uh, infinite… I mean, if you have an infinite system, this has an infinite number of conserved quantities, all of which conserve also commute with each other. So, if you have n sites, there are… you would normally think there are 2 to the n's states because it's been half on every side, but the number of hexagons is n by 2, right, because the unit cell has two sides and every hexagon has a conserved quantity. So, you find that um, the number of… so, the number of W's is n by 2 and so, there are all these sectors corresponding to the different W's being plus 1, plus 1, plus 1 or plus 1, minus 1, plus 1 or minus 1 and so on. So, there are 2 to the power n by 2 possible values of the w's when you go over all the hexagons. And so, these are all the different sectors of the model. Different sectors do not talk to each other because, you know, the w's coming to the Hamiltonian. So, the different sectors uh, sort of block diagonal along with the Hamiltonian. Okay. So, the 2 to the n states that you have actually break up into 2 to the power n by 2 blocks and each of those blocks has only 2 to the power n by 2 states. Now, because of this conserved quantities, it turns out that the ZZ interactions become local in terms of the Majorana fermions. So, how is that? So, if you have this interaction between, uh, you know, sigma 1 Z, sigma 2 Z, as I said, you will get a string of… in terms of fermions, you will get the product of these two fermions times a string of W… Uh, str a Jordan-Wigner string going like that. But if you look carefully at that string, you will see that it is actually a product of these operators W1, W2, W3 and so on. Okay. So, sigma 1 Z, sigma 2 Z is actually… well, it also has two Majorana fermi fermions here and then it is product of W's. So, depending on which sector you are in, in any particular sector, all these W's take some fixed values, plus minus 1. And also, this removes two of the Majorana fermions. So, something which is fourth order in the fermions now is left with something which is second order, quadratic. Okay. So, that is the long story of why the Kitai model, uh, the ZZ interactions are also local and quadratic in terms of fermions. 
Now, there are all these different sectors. So, uh, how do you know which sector you have to work in? So, here you need some numerical work, but actually, you can also show it analytically by using the various theorems about matrices. That the ground state lies in the sector where all the w's are equal to plus 1. Okay. So, if you are only interested in the ground state, then there is only one out of these 2 to the n by 2 sectors that you have to work in. So, uh, so that is a great simplification. So, in that sector, the Hamiltonian becomes this. So, it is extremely simple, right. It only has couplings between nearest neighbors, quadratic, um, it is bipartite. So, the B um, Majorana fermion at any site interacts at the, sorry, the B at the, on the sublattice B, I am using the same symbol, I hope that is not confusing. So, on sublattice B, you have the B Majorana fermion, this interacts with the A Majorana fermions on the three near, nearest neighbors. Um, this n is the location of the a's and b's on the un some unit cell and this m's and m1 and m2 are the vectors connecting one unit cell to the other. Okay. I don't know if I have defined them somewhere, it doesn't matter, just some geometrical factors. Okay. All right. Um, any questions so far? So, we can discuss this model also in the tutorial. Okay. So, um, so now you have something which is quadratic. However, these are Majorana fermions, right? So, A dagger is A and B, is B dagger. So, because of that, the Fourier transform has a little bit of an extra thing in it is the following. When you define the Fourier transform, this a n has to be of this form a k to the i k n plus a dagger k to the minus i k n. Normally, if you take fermions, ordinary fermions where c is not equal to c dagger, when you do a Fourier transform, c goes to c k and c dagger goes to c dagger. But here, a has to go to both a and a dagger because a has to be Hermitian. So, it cannot have only a k. It has to have both a k and a k dagger. Now, because of that, since this term automatically has both k and minus k, this sum over k runs over only half the Brillouin zone. So, that is another thing about Majorana fermions that when you do a Fourier transform, that Fourier transform only lives over half the Brillouin zone, not the full Brillouin zone. Okay. So, the Brillouin zone of the hexagonal lattice can be chosen in many different ways. I find this the most convenient. The Brillouin zone of a hexagonal lattice, you can choose it to be a rhombus which is, uh, you know, it has four corners, but half the Brillouin zone is just an equilateral triangle, okay. So, all our um, k points are going to lie over in this equilateral triangle. I have shown you where the corners are. Fine. Um, so, now the Hamiltonian on the Kitai model, when you go to this um, A, K and B, K, it takes this form. So, now it takes actually a very simple form. In fact, it even looks number conserving. So, it is kind of very peculiar because um, this is, this is a Majorana fermion, so it really does not make sense to talk about the number. But it basically looks like A dagger A, B dagger B, A dagger B kind of terms. You do not get A dagger A, B dagger times terms, right. So, it does not look super converting. Um, um, so, again, it looks like A dagger B dagger some 2 by 2 matrix A B. And the 2 by 2 matrix has this form where this m1, m2 are just the vectors connecting, this is just geometrical factors, vectors connecting one unit cell to the neighboring unit cell. And it is completely off diagonal, so it just has the Pauli matrices sigma 1, sigma 2. These are not the original spin variables, these are just the Pauli matrices which act on the A and B sub lattices, so pseudo spin matrices. So, uh, this is a system of non interacting Majorana fermions, and then depending on the values of J1, J2, J3, there may or may not be a gap between the ground state and the first state cells. So, what is the phase diagram of this model? Okay. So, the phase diagram is like this. So, this is a very neat way of showing the phase diagram. See, there are three parameters J1, J2, J3, right? So, normally you would, I would have to draw a three dimensional picture to show you the phase diagram and it would be very hard to see anything in a three dimensional picture. So, the way the phase diagram is shown is as follows. 
So let's say you scale j1, j2, j3 so that the sum of the three is one. You can always do that, right? Because the phase diagram only depends on, it is it's independent of the overall scaling of the parameters in the hammock. So let's say j1 plus j2 plus j3 is one. Now this is a problem from uh, known to Euclid that um, if you have three positive numbers adding up to one, then there's a nice way of parameterizing that. You draw an equilateral triangle with a particular um, length, I forgotten what it is, two root three or root three, such that the, um, if you take any point inside the triangle, the distances of that point from the three sides adds up to one. So if you have three numbers, j1, j2, j3 adding up to one, you can show them as a point inside an equilateral triangle with the convention that suppose this is the point, then the distance from this side is j3, the distance from that side is j1 and the distance from this side is j2. Okay. So basically you can show this phase diagram in terms of points in an equilateral triangle. So you've reduced a three-dimensional parameter space to a two-dimensional parameter space. In this space, um, the system turns out to be gapped. So this you can show. So I didn't actually show you the um, spectrum explicitly, but you, you can work it out from here, right? It's the sum of two Pauli matrices. So the energy levels are this line squared plus this line squared, square root of that plus minus, right? That's the energy spectrum. So instead of showing you that complicated picture, let me just show you the phase diagram. So in this equilateral triangle, it turns out that there are four smaller equilateral triangles. The middle equilateral triangle is where the system is gapless, okay? Uh, so in this, at any point in this uh, region, uh, there's no gap between the ground state and the first excited state. Now the first excited state could be, uh, will have some k of course, some value of k. It turns out here that there's a whole line of points in k space on which the gap is zero, okay? So instead of having isolated points, you can show that there's a line of uh, points in k-space where the gap vanishes. So it's a very peculiar gapless region. There are three other equilateral triangles which are gapped. Okay, so these are the triangles where one of the couplings is bigger than the sum of the other two. Right, so when one of them is bigger than the other, sum of the other two, it turns out it's gapped. Whereas if none of them is bigger than the other two, in other words, they satisfy this triangle relation. Each of them is less than the sum of the other two, then it's gapless. Okay, so I'm just stating this. You can easily derive this from the energy spectrum. So is this phase diagram clear? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's standard fermions. So AK, <coughs> AK anti commutes with AK prime. AK with AK prime dagger is delta KK prime. Uh, A's and B's and anti-commute. Okay, so these are a standard uh, normal fermion anti-commutation relations. Yeah. Yes, the, the spectrum that you would get from this two by two Hamiltonian. Okay, good. Yes. So that's a very good question. So it turns out that, um, so there are actually um, two kinds of excitations. One is you're within a certain sector of W's and then you look at this Majorana fermion excitations. The other one is you go from one sector to another sector. So you take one of the W's in the ground state sector, they're all plus one, but you flip one of them to minus one. Then it takes you to another sector. So it turns out all the other sectors are separated from the ground state sector by a finite gap. Okay. So when I say gapless, uh, I really mean this is gapless um, for the entire system. But in the gap, um, it may turn out that a different sector has a smaller gap than this sector by itself. Okay, now, um, so I won't say more about the, why Kitaev came up with this model, but I'll just, let me just say a few words here. So there are two kinds of excitations. There are these Majorana fermion excitations and there are these sector excitations where you turn some of the W's to plus or minus one. 
So it turns out that these two kinds of excitations have extremely interesting statistics with respect to each other. So, um, so I don't even remember this properly. I think the, the sector excitations, which are called vortex excitations, have semionic statistics. If you take one around the other, <coughs> if you exchange two of them, uh, fermionic statistics would be you pick up a minus sign if you exchange two particles. Semionic statistics, semion means halfway, semi, between bosons and fermions. So if you exchange the two vortex excitations, you pick up a phase of plus i or minus i instead of plus minus one. <laughs> and similarly, there are interesting statistics when you take a vortex around a Majorana excitation and so on. So, um, and in general, you get non-abelian statistics here. Okay. So, in fact, that is one of the things that, uh, that is interesting about this model, that um, some of these excitations actually have non-abelian statistics with respect to each other, uh, which means that um, if you look at the wave function, it's not a single component object. So, the multiparticle wave function is not a single component object. It has several components. And when you exchange two particles, this multi-component wave function gets multiplied by a unitary matrix rather than a phase. Okay. And different exchanges correspond to different unitary matrices which don't commute with each other. So, that's the non-abelian statistic. So, there's a lot of stuff in this. And uh, if you really want to, uh, you know, if you're curious about this model, you can read this paper. I should tell you that this, I think, has a, about of the order of 100 pages. <laughs> in fact, Kita was very reluctant to write this up. He, he spoke about this model in many places and just refused to write it up. And uh, I think finally somebody uh, really convinced him that it's worth writing up. That's the phase diagram. Okay, this is where I planned to stop, 30 slides. Um, but there are three minutes left, so unless you have questions, I'll move up one more slide. Yeah. Oh, oh, because this originally came from these ANs and BNs, right? And the ANs and BNs are Majorana fermions. There's, they're Hermitian and they satisfy anti commutation relations, but they're Hermitian. So to see the Majorana ness, you have to go back to the A and B language, AN and BN. Yeah, yeah, but just from the spectrum, you can never tell whether something is Majorana or standard Dirac, right? You have to look at the real space wave uh, functions. Yeah. 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 It's all. It's. Yeah, it's all over the place. I mean, these excitations are all over the place. In fact, uh, these are just bulk excitations. I've not even spoken about what happens if you have a finite system with edges. Yeah. Let's discuss this later because it's really relevant to the this talk. Right? Okay, let me just show one more slide because, so this is an example that for a certain particular value of J1, J2, J3, uh, you know, in fact, this is when J1 is equal to J2 and J3 is something else. Then you find that there is this pair of lines on which the system is gapless. Okay, so this is typically what happens in this model in the gapless region. You have lines or curves in general on which this, the gap is zero. Okay, so I think I'll stop here. And if there are any other questions I can answer. That's right. Oh, I see. Yeah, so he's asking, um, 
that this relation between a d-dimensional quantum mechanical model and a d plus one dimensional um, classical model, this is only true if z is one. Um, okay, so I'm a, I have a little bit of confusion here. So, so z has a very clear meaning in quantum mechanics. Right? You can see it from the way the the energy goes to zero when you approach the critical point. Z has no uh, no unique meaning in classical mechanics, right? Because there are many different kinds of dynamics that you can have classically, and they can uh, give rise to various you know different uh, behaviors of the system. So I'm not quite sure what uh, the equivalent of whether there's a unique Z that you can talk about in classical models. But uh, it's probably anyway. So if the quantum mechanical model has Z equal to one, I, th I guess that's that's necessary to map it to a d plus one dimension. Am I right? Am I making a mistake here? Right. Oh, I see. No, no. The time dimension, the dispersion would be due to that. It'd be an isotropic in whatever the additional direction. Oh, I see. It will still be d plus 1, but the, it will be an isotropic. Questions? If not, let's thank Dipti Mandar.